So since we've determined that the pore pressure is important, then well, we'll come back to that. We've determined that the pore pressure is important, and momentarily we'll look at the, this, you know, how you can estimate the pore pressure, or talk about ways that you can come up with a pore pressure. But uh, before we do that, we'll just look at hypothetical scenarios. So, like I said, we can bound we can bound the minimum and maximum principal stresses with respect to the pore pressure. And then if we combine that with the Andersonian fault theory, we can come up with some, these are just qualitative plots of how these things are related to each other. So in normal faulting, again, according to Andersonian fault theory, in normal faulting, the vertical stress is greater than SH max is greater than SH min, right? And so these plots are a little bit hard to read, but I'll try to put some color on them. So, so the vertical stress is this line. And we know in a normal faulting regime, that's the greatest, right? It's the largest value, OK? The pore pressure. we know has to be less than the maximum stress difference, otherwise you'd have hydraulic fracture. So these are sort of, in the normal faulting regime, the, the upper and lower bounds, okay? And so then, in between, we have SH max, and SH min, okay? And what you'll see is, in a case, well, and, and I guess I need to define hydrostatic. So what I mean by hydro, hydrostatic is that the pore pressure increases just according to the hydrostatic head, just according to depth, right? The 0.44 PSI per foot, right? So just according to depth only. There's, there's no, nothing else there. Of course, we know in, in real life, as we go down, there can be um, compartmentalization, meaning you can have areas of the earth that, you know, if you think about you have sand and shale and sand and shale, well, the shale is impermeable, certainly with respect to the sand, right, which is very permeable. So in that, in that scenario, you can have situations where the pressure in the areas of high permeability due to other mechanisms can become higher than just the normal static head pressure, right? So the, the static or the hydrostatic means as if there's just a column of water there and nothing else, what would the pore pressure be, okay? So then overpressure is just generically something more than that, okay? So something more than just a static column of water. Okay, so one thing you'll notice in the hydrostatic case is that the principal stresses with respect to the pore pressure and the principal stresses always diverge, meaning, you know, they're always getting farther away from each other with depth. Okay, that's always true in the hydrostatic case. In the overpressure case, that's not true. Okay, so in the overpressure case, um, again, these are hypothetical. They're not actually, this is not real data. This is just, we're just bounding the relationship of the, of the stresses. So if we have a pore pressure that changes with depth due to some other mechanism, which we haven't defined yet, you know, how that can occur, then that basically pushes the Let's see if I can use the same colors here. So the vertical stress SH max and SH min. So 
the thing that's different, I don't know if you can see that, but you know, SH Min initially diverges from SH Max, but then due to the pore pressure, it's it's forced back closer, right? So they, they're not always in you know diverging from one another in the overpressure scenario. Okay. So in a strike slip fault, and again, according to Anderson fault classification, SH max greater than the vertical stress greater than SH min. So here's the vertical stress, SH max, SH min, pore pressure. And then we see the same phenomenon here. So the pore pressure changes with depth. <laughs> causing SH min to also change with depth. So in reverse faulting, the vertical stress is the smallest. Pore pressure over here. SH max. SH min. Now in this scenario, it's different <clears throat> because while the vertical stress will always be greater than the pore pressure, uh, it's ignoring transients, so ignoring dynamic, you know, something that would cause the pore pressure to increase rapidly for a short time, right? Maybe because you're pumping, you're injecting fluid or something like that. So ignoring that, in normal in situ in the earth, the Vertical stress will always be greater than the pore pressure. And so in this case, it, the horizontal, the uh, the vertical stress is not influenced by the pore pressure in the way that SH max and SH min are in, in the other cases. So how do we measure these stresses? And this is just an overview. Later in the class, we're going to get into more details about you know, how we actually measure these. But the vertical stress, the typical way to do it is through the integration of density logs, right? And that's what we basically already showed. The minimum uh, principal stress, which is SH min, except for in reverse faulting scenarios, is obtained from many fracs or leak-off tests, so we'll talk about that later. So these are, scenar these are actually tests where we produce a hydraulic fracture, and then we, looking at the pressure logs from the well and the history as the, as the pressure decays, we can infer some information about the stress state of the, uh, about the stress state because of the relationship between pore pressure and stress in the, and the stress, right? And we'll talk about how those are done later. Um, the pore pressure itself, we measure, we can measure directly uh, downhole, or we can estimate it. If, you know, if we don't actually drilling a well, we can estimate it from geophysical logs or seismic data. Um, and then we can bound SH max with the frictional strength of crust or observations from wellbore failure. So, 
you know, uh, a, a very large bound on the difference between S, SH min and SH max would be the strength of the rock, right? Because rock has very low tensile strength. And so if, if, if the strength of the, if the difference between SH min and SH max ever exceeded that, then you would fail the rock, okay? However, most of the rock in the earth already has fractures in it, right? It has lots of natural fractures and faults in it. And so you can't really just look at that. It has to do with the friction along those natural fractures uh, and faults that are in the earth and, and those, those things can give us an idea on the bounds between SH min and SH max. So that's a very sort of crude way to get at SH max. Better estimates would be observations from wellbore failures. So when we have a wellbore, and you, if you can look at along the wellbore in certain ways, <coughs> tensile failures that occur when, or compressive failures that occur when the hoop stress along the wellbore exceeds the strength of the rock and causes it to fail then in, the, in these cases we can infer some information about the stress state in the earth. Uh, and then we get, you know, the orientation of principal stresses. So, so the first four bullets really have to do with measuring or inferring magnitudes. Uh, and again, we talked about you need four things to get a complete picture of the stress, right? What are those four things? Right? Well, three of them are magnitudes, right? You need SH min, SH max, S, SV, vertical stress, right? So those three things are magnitudes. And then you know one direction, right? Or we can assume that one direction is normal to the surface of the Earth, and that's the vertical stress. So then the only other thing we need is one of the two other directions. So those are the four things, the three magnitudes and one of the other two directions, because we assume the vertical stress is a principal direction. So then the orientation from that we get from wellbore observations, geology, earthquake, focal mechanisms, and we'll talk about those things later in the class. So this is just a, an overview of things to come. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of... Um, information out there and, and that where data has been compiled from a lot of these sources and let me see if this works. I think if I, oh, can't believe that worked. Uh, so what, what you see here, this is a, there's actually a, a project where they're trying to map from a bunch of different measurements the stress state you know, roughly all, all around the world. And so this is a map of the United States, and, and these are, you know, the different symbols on the map are from focal measurements, wellbore breakouts, drilling-induced fracture, hydraulic fracture, geological indicators. So based on all of these things, and of course, there's a lot of green over there in California. Anybody know why? Well, not, I mean, that's, there's a lot of earthquakes in California, therefore we have a lot of we have a lot of earthquake focal mechanism data from, from California, and that's why we have a pretty good idea of the stress state, uh, uh, or you know, we have lots of measurements that can infer the stress state. So uh, there's a link on the bottom of this slide that can that shows you uh, uh, a reference, and there's a whole lot of information about the stress state around the earth can be inferred from where they've compiled all this data. Okay. 